lot. And thanks so much for the invitation and uh, to Ed for hosting me while I'm here. I really appreciate the opportunity to come tell you about uh, some of the work that we've been doing and kind of quantum computing more broadly. So as it was explained to me, this kind of broad colloquium, we're going to have uh, some quantum computing experts. We're going to have some kind of physics experts and maybe more generally uh, people that are experts in areas of engineering or otherwise that might be interested in the topic. And so I'm going to try to start with a rather gentle introduction to the field and some of its uh, current ongoings and quirks to help bring everyone along. And then as the presentation goes on, I will slowly ramp into uh, more technical aspects related to current research in quantum computing. And so I hope there's a little bit of something for everyone in the talk. So I'd like to, to start these talks with a little bit of a quantum timeline. And people often ask the question, why now? Uh, so you probably have heard about quantum computing many times in the past. If you're not uh, paying attention too closely, you might have wondered why it kind of ebbed and flowed, like suddenly quantum was very popular and then less popular. And I think one of the first big peaks was around here in 1994 with Shor's factoring algorithm, which if you're not familiar, uh, was an algorithm that was proposed on a quantum computer that had the potential to threaten much of the cryptography that we use on the internet and in other places today. So people became very interested in that time. A lot of three-letter agencies were very afraid. Um, and then slightly after that, they realized that qubits were very, very hard to build. Of course, they're still hard to build. Um, but some developments later on uh, in both the side of theoretical error correction that brought a lot of the requirements down, at least from what they used to be, and the development of much better qubits meant that people could look at some of these systems and say that, well, we knew it was very fragile and almost impossible to do interesting algorithms with our noise levels. It looks like with qubits of this quality, if we could just replicate them exactly at this quality and in large enough scale, we have the potential to do arbitrary length calculations and do this type of uh, Shor's factoring algorithm or other interesting problems. And so what this meant to a lot of uh, companies and a lot of governments was that there was no longer maybe a fundamental physics barrier to achieving this problem. So for a while people thought quantum computing might just be impossible, but rather an extremely hard engineering problem and perhaps a few additional physics barriers to overcome, but now it was a risk worth taking. So you saw a lot of people jump into the game, a lot more investment, a lot more people are now interested in quantum computing. And I think this interest is going to kind of hit another echelon when us or others that are working towards achieving this goal of quantum supremacy, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, uh, sort of announce such a result and the field gets a buzz. And then I think people are going to realize that that result did not immediately mean you can now do practical things with your computer. So there's going to be a little bit of dip in interest and we have to get to practical applications as soon as we can, perhaps before we have fully error corrected computers. And so this is largely the area that I work in, trying to figure out how a very powerful quantum device, but one which is in theory not perfect, can be quite useful for this type of problem. And so just to kind of catch everyone up, this uh, issue of quantum supremacy was essentially a proposal for how you can design an experiment and race it against all possible uh, computations on a classical supercomputer and show some immense advantage. So something that is, say, doable in seconds on the quantum device might take years or millennia on all of the supercomputers that we have today. But the problem that was chosen was sort of engineered to help quantum computers as much as possible. And this means that it might not be in principle practical for some time. So it represents an amazing physics experiment. It represents a huge achievement and it's a useful tool for actually bringing up the quantum device. But it itself is going to create quite a bit of a storm that we're going to need to make a rush towards practical applications as soon as possible. So what are the early application areas that people are actually talking about? Um, so they're usually not related to, say, breaking codes. Um, they're often talking about optimization problems, so combinatorial optimization like logistics scheduling, um, where should I send this fleet, which problems uh, that I'm looking at. And so with this type of problem, we're looking towards what speed ups we can achieve, right? So if you talk about the development of GPUs and uh, uh, FPGAs and things like that, you're often talking about trying to get some constant factor speed up kind of proportional to the number of chips or things that you have. Here we're talking about uh, kind of scaling level speed ups in a way that you might imagine say that 
People often use the term quadratic speed up, which might mean something like a problem that used to take a year takes two weeks. Or in the case of quantum simulation, the goal, you know, we haven't achieved this quite yet, is that we can take problems that used to, in theory, take 10 to the 82 years and reduce them down to 300 seconds. So the dream is then to make something absolutely impossible into something routine. And to give you kind of a barometer for that number, the age of the universe, according to Wikipedia, is something like 14 times 10 to the 9 years. So it's a calculation that is so immense that you could barely even conceive of it down to something that's relatively routine. And so just to kind of bring people up to speed of when I say quantum, I'm just going to give a very basic definition of what I mean by quantum system in case some of you say study systems which are not so close to quantum. Um, I don't mean Duracell quantum or uh, any other marketing gimmicks you've probably seen recently. What I really mean is that we have an assumption of how physics works on the everyday macroscopic scale. If I throw a beanbag through one of these two holes, I expect it to go through one of these two holes. Um, but what happens if we cool down systems very, very cold and control them very precisely and look very carefully, you can see that sometimes when you throw a ball through one of these holes, it will go through both and interfere with itself. And so what I mean by quantum systems, since in principle everything is governed by quantum mechanics, is something that we are controlling precise enough that it's a physical system that's operated in a regime where we need effects like discrete levels or interference to accurately describe it. And we're going to leverage that physics into a computational model that if we just count the number of operations we do with that model, they are, appear to be significantly less than in the traditional computing case for certain problems. And so kind of classical computing, if you didn't know, had its roots in simulation, which is to say people used to build mechanical models of the solar system before they could digitally compute where the planets might be. And there's evidence that these types of mechanisms existed as early as 125 BC. But of course, classical balls look a lot different than electrons moving around. And so Feynman was the one of the first to say that essentially, well, it would make a lot more sense if I want to model a quantum system to use another quantum system. And this kind of birthed the era of quantum simulation. And so what are some example systems? So I said it was really any system that you could cool down and control sufficiently precisely. And of course, we have things like superconducting qubits that are cooled down in these fridges, or photons, or ion traps, or the quantum dot qubits that are developed here. These are all examples of good systems that we can then tightly control and use that physics to attempt to build uh, one of these devices. And of course, it's a little bit of a, a long road to go from quantum simulation to something like computation. But a lot of these uh, algorithms follow a similar pattern, which is you prepare some state of your system, you evolve it forward in time, and you measure only what you want to know. So this information extraction point will be rather crucial to the story. And you can think of it a little bit like uh, these particles on marionette strings that you're making dance exactly like a different system that you're interested in. And this is the essence of sort of quantum simulation. But you might say that simulating particles is quite a bit different than factoring numbers. And for this, we needed this abstraction where we leaned on computer science a bit to move to more abstract problems like linear partial differential equations, factoring products of two large primes. Um, but this core ev prepare, evolve, and measure is always going to play a central role uh, in these types of systems. So what is the abstraction that we talk about? Just to give everyone a bit of language, um, you've probably heard about these a million times in the, the media. Um, but if you have a classical bit, which can be 0 or 1, a qubit we call a as being 0, 1, or something in between. And if you're more of a mathematical person, we often use this notation of putting these qubits into a vector space. And then we act on these qubits in some way. So we often write these circuit diagrams, which I'm not going to make a whole lot of use of because they're a little bit opaque um, for a general uh, talk, um, which is you read them like music notation from left to right. So qubit 0, 1, and 2 get hit by one of these operations that you do on the device. And the way you build a quantum device is essentially have a set of qubits, and you calibrate each one of these as some operation on your device, like a microwave pulse sequence or something that you do. And then you just use a lookup table to hit the qubits with that every time you go around. And for example, one of these might be represented by a 2 by 2 matrix that flips a qubit from 0 to 1. So I think it's important that even after you've introduced the qubit to talk a little bit about myths in quantum computing, because if you're trying to follow the field from the outside, you might have seen a lot of half-correct statements said, or uh, things that are a little bit misleading but somewhat true. And so the, some of the most popular ones of these is that 
Quantum computers are faster or better because they can use an exponential number of states. Um, that's sort of, sort of true, but if you think a little bit harder, classical bits can also occupy an exponential number of states, just not at the same time. So that statement on its own is not super meaningful. And you say, OK, well, I meant at the same time, and because faster or better, because bits can be 0 and 1 at the same time. And if you think a little bit about what that means, you could kind of construct an analog uh, classical bit that has a similar property that can be between 0 and 1. And so that doesn't feel quite right either. Um, and so in that case, you have to invoke the fact that just being between 0 and 1 is not enough. They have to be able to entangle and interact with their friends so that the same precision you can express exponentially more information than even this analog case. And finally, the most pervasive one that inspired even Scott Aronson to write a comic about it um, is that it works by computing all the answers in parallel. Um, and so I'll just read for you the important thing for you to understand is that quantum computing isn't just a matter of trying all the answers in parallel. So it is true that you can give it all the inputs you want and it will compute on all of those inputs and give an answer, but unless they constructively interfere in just the right way, like that ball interfering with itself, um, they will just produce for you an answer at random, which is no better than trying a simple input at once. So there are a few special cases we found, such as Schwartz factoring algorithm, where all of the, the paths kind of interfere in just the right way to give you a singular answer. But this is by far not the most common thing that happens. Usually you try to write an algorithm down, and you figure out that it's quite hard or there's some restriction you didn't know about. So generally speaking, what are the challenges in making some of these devices or making uh, quantum computation really uh, working reality for us? Um, so on the side of this prepare, you can often have a number of qubits problem. So you might hear that, say, devices have um, 50 or 70 qubits these days. Um, and you know, you'll say, well, my classical processor has 64 bits. It can uh, sure do a lot of problems for me. But the problem is, it seems to be if we want to retain all of that beautiful quantum advantage, we need to have all of that within one device. So if I'm missing one qubit and my problem doesn't fit, it's not always obvious how to put part of that problem off of the device. So this is kind of this n minus 1 qubit problem. A big problem you'll also hear about is coherence, time, and fidelity. So as I mentioned before, quantum information needs to be kind of very cold and precisely controlled. And so if you have a little bit of environmental disturbance, you can run into problems very quickly. This will ultimately lead to a time scale problem that if your algorithm is too long, you simply can't complete it or get anything out. And one that's less well appreciated, I feel, is this information extraction problem, um, which there is a new requirement on how to put information into and out of the device that if you were to ever look for a full readout, you might lose your quantum advantage. And I'll highlight an example of that in a second. So one, one way to go is to simply design better hardware. Um, and you would like to say that, well, maybe we can just reach perfect, perfect extremes. But uh, I like to say that maybe we should all meet in the middle, and we will co-design better algorithms that are coherence time flexible, and maybe are flexible on some of these other regards that as the device gets better, your answer gets better, but you're never stuck in a weird situation where I just can't run anything at all on the device. So thinking differently for speed ups, why is it so hard to construct a quantum algorithm um, that achieves a speed up for one of these problems? And I'm just going to kind of boil this down for one example where we did find a speed up, but it's a little bit of a nuanced uh, issue. So let's take the very simple problem of solving a linear system of equations. So AX equals B, where A is some matrix and X and B are vectors. And the solution means write down the entries of X for me. So if you're familiar with, say, numerical linear algebra, you know that there's simple ways of doing this problem. In the worst case, it usually has n cubed complexity. For sparse problems, it's often n, uh, where that's the size of the vector. And now someone tells you, I found a quantum algorithm that achieves an exponential speed up on this problem. And you're like, wow, that's great. And then you look at it and you're like, that seems like it can't be true. It would cost you at least n to write the answer down. And you would be right. And so to achieve a quantum speed up on this algorithm, what people did was they changed the phrasing of the problem a little bit. 
What they did instead was say that the solution translates to preparing a state x, which contains the solution, from which one can sample. This is a subtly different way of phrasing the problem and still does something useful, but it was a necessary step in order to achieve that type of speed up. So this is the kind of not obvious change that you might have to make in order to find one of these speed ups. So you've changed the question, um, but you've managed to solve the problem. So you can see that developing a quantum algorithm isn't usually a matter of, say, taking Gaussian elimination and writing it in terms of unitary gates. You sometimes have to think more broadly about the tools available and how you can form the problem in a way that's minimal. And this is why it's been so hard to find really compelling quantum speedups for some of these problems. And you might say, OK, you said this was useful. Give me at least one example. And the one that sort of floated around in the literature um, is that if you're doing large scale, say, finite element simulations, say, that are looking at radar scatter cross sections off a plane, you don't actually care about the intimate details of every point on that mesh. You care about one aggregate number. So this is a case where sampling from that state might still be quite advantageous, whereas you can see here that if we read out every entry, we would be at best as good as the classical algorithm and usually quite worse. So this is an important kind of consideration anytime you're thinking about finding a quantum speed up in this, this regard. So getting back to the early application areas as I'm going to transition here in a minute to talking more about chemistry and a little bit more on the, the technical side of what's happening. Um, we had optimization, um, relation representation, which I didn't talk a lot about. You might have heard some buzz about quantum machine learning, and this is related to um, interest in the quantum supremacy problem, which kind of postulates that there are probability distributions we can create with very short circuits that are hard to sample from, and therefore they might be useful in uh, classification tasks. I won't dive into that, but I'm happy to talk about it later if anyone's interested. And then, of course, quantum simulation, which is the, the problem that I spend much of my time focused on, and it's how do you use one tightly controllable quantum system to mimic one of interest that you don't have such good insight or control in in a lab. And I'm going to focus more on the chemistry aspect of this than, say, the nuclear physics aspect, though I do think a lot of interesting work is going to be done in that area as well. So what do I mean when I say simulating chemistry? Um, it's often phrased as quantum chemistry or computational chemistry. And if you're not familiar with what this general field is, the idea is that if I'm given some loose idea of a molecular structure, this might be, say, where the atoms and molecules are in a protein backbone, um, I would like just from that structure to get some degree of understanding. And what do I mean by understanding? I mean, how does it absorb light? How does it complex with other species? How does it interact with a, a metal surface? And then it takes another step to use that understanding to gain some degree of control. So if I know exactly why systems absorb light, I might be able to design new photovoltaics. If I know why different protein species complex, I might be able to design a drug to inhibit that process and prevent the onset of disease. If I know things, why things interact with surfaces the way they do, perhaps I can design new heterogeneous catalysts that can get something like platinum out of a catalytic converter. And you might say, well, this all sounds like a very grand dream. How do you propose to do that with any kind of calculation? Um, uh, we're in kind of an interesting situation, which is if you take a very naive look at it, the problem is to some extent solved for us. And I use this famous quote by Dirac a little bit flippantly, where I'll go into the, the details in a second, which says, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. The difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. And written in its most innocuous form, what it kind of refers to is this time-independent Schrodinger equation, where I've encoded some molecule digitally in my device um, in terms of these qubits, ones and zeros. And if I solve for the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this linear problem, then I get out most of what I would like to know about this system, how it absorbs light, how it complexes with other species, all of the things on that wonderful understanding line that I then hope to bootstrap into control. Um, so you might say, um, you know, how big might the speed up be for us? And this was the problem that I was trying to highlight uh, at some point, which is there have been a few concrete calculations done now in the literature all the way up to the level of gates that would be required, so individual operations within something like the surface code. And we have problems that if you naively wrote them down in the classical case, they appear to take something like 10 to the 82 years, whereas on something like a modest quantum processor exhibiting something like a kilohertz repetition rate as a pair compared to, say, your um, 
gigahertz classical processor, then it would take something on the order of 300 seconds. And this is including all the overhead for error correction, the surface code, and everything like that, which appears to be quite promising for these very hard problems. And so this is the kind of the reason that we're building up to these. So we do these estimates in the far future of what a theoretically perfect device could do in order to understand what we're building towards and have a design pathway, even though that's not something we can immediately do today. And so what is the challenge of chemistry? So I just told you that a linear eigenvalue problem uh, was sufficient to tell me everything I wanted to know about these chemical systems. So why is the problem not already done? Um, and it will turn out that the power of quantum computing is vastly related or Im immensely related to the sort of challenge of chemistry. So what is this problem restated in a different way? I'm essentially asking if I write down uh, some molecule and I chunk up space into boxes, I'm going to ask where do the electrons sit? At a fundamental level, that's the question that I want, and that's what I get all of my properties from. And so if I chunk up space in a very special way using orbitals that you might know from chemistry, I can get a little bit of speed up. So this might be you know, long in the past for some of you um, if you're not doing chemistry. But basically what I'll ask is given uh, m of these things, um, how many places can I put the different electrons? And I'll check each one of those. And I can put it in m of these sites. But as soon as I have two electrons, I can put it in m squared places. And you can kind of follow this logic forward to its natural conclusion, which is in, if you don't count anti-symmetry so closely, the number of places you can put these electrons scales is something like m to the n. And for a very small, actually pretty bad representation of a molecule where m might be 100 and n is 80, the, the number of places you can go is already 10 to the 160. So to give you a feeling for that number, the number of particles in the universe is something like 10 to the 80. So it's as if every particle in the universe had a universe within it, and that's the dimension of the problem I'm attempting to solve. So this is, of course, wildly intractable to do in the most naive way. And this is, it happens to also be the space where qubits naturally live. So the essence of how I do quantum uh, chemistry on a quantum computer is to exploit the natural exploration of this space and then measure only the quantities that I need. If I enumerated all of these uh, coefficients, of course there's no speed up, but what I'm going to do is extract only the properties that I care about. And of course there have been a wealth of other methods developed to approximately do these types of things classically, like density functional theory, which work extremely well for a lot of systems, but have a few uh, gaps that we're still quite interested in. So just to give you a a feel for what I mean by this. I think the closest analogy that people come to um, with quantum devices is probability distributions. Um, so what happens if, say, there's 16 places you'd like, you like eating for lunch, and there's someone else that has their own preferences? You have some probability distribution of where the two of you end up. And this looks a lot like something like, say, a neural network might handle classically. And if you looked at those quantum circuit diagrams, you might notice a kind of um, at least vague similarity. And in the case where you know, these two people have no interest in each other or have, they're not friends, this factorizes and the amount of information is just one times the other. Or this is kind of like a naive Bayes if you're familiar with uh, machine learning. But if they know each other, this does not factorize. And storing that joint distribution can scale something like exponential exactly like that last slide. So I have to keep track of an immense space. And this is what we compactly try to do with these machine learning networks or deep neural networks. And on the quantum side, this is what we're going to try to do with parametrized circuits. So for early circuits, we're going to say, I'm going to try to uh, approximate where these electrons sit with something that looks like a classical neural network, but on my quantum device. And the key caveat being that our distributions are complex valued. Meaning in my quantum world, these two people can interfere with each other and end up not in the same place by accident. So that will be the key difference where my people will become electrons. So we're, all, we're working all the time towards an important problem. And this gets mentioned all of the time in uh, different news outlets as to where quantum computing is heading, what problems we would like to solve with it. And so I want to take some time to highlight this particular problem, which is uh, the problem of nitrogen fixation. So what is nitrogen fixation? At a coarsely grained level, you're taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and you're combining it with hydrogen to form some form of ammonia that might be used for fertilizer. So this process is sometimes called the reaction that feeds the world. It's crucial for our large-scale agriculture. 
And at the moment, it's done by the Haber-Bosch process um, at very large scales. And it happens at 400 degrees Celsius and 200 times atmospheric pressure. By current estimates, it uses 1 to 2 percent of all energy on Earth, which uh, that's a lot of energy. And on the other hand, you say, well, you know, plants and things were around. Animals were eating long before we had industrial factories. So where was that coming from? Um, and actually, nature is able to do it in a much more benign way which is at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, which it had better be able to if it's just sitting in the soil. Um, and essentially, we've boiled down to where this happens within this nitrogenase enzyme all the way down to this active site made of iron and molybdenum. But getting a precise image of what's happening in terms of the electronic structure where the substrates are coming in and binding seems to be uh, currently inaccessible to classical methods. They either are unable to scale to that size and give no answer, or they give an answer that appears to be inaccurate for this type of system. And so what we would like to posit is that while classically there's not a clear path to an accurate solution, quantum mechanically something like 150 to 200 logical qubits may be enough to provide us with insights we've never seen before for this type of system. And this is the kind of system that we have in mind when we want to move forward and develop everything we can to get as close as possible to these targets. We really want to solve useful and interesting problems, and if we make progress, Will competitive methods also make progress? Absolutely, but this is the way we kind of uh, move forward. So how does one use a device uh, that is not you know, fully logical qubit ready to do this type of simulation? So I've titled this kind of using a post-supremacy device for simulation, and what do I mean by that? I mean that if you had a device which you assumed to be capable of this quantum supremacy experiment, what does it immediately imply for your ability to do simulation? And is it an optimistic future or one that can, uh, requires a little bit of work? So this is a, an image that Julian uh, from our hardware team showed a, uh, about two years ago at the March meeting for the bristle cone device with 72 qubits. And the goal is to simulate as interesting a physical phenomenon as possible that is as close to classically intractable as possible. So what this is not is the largest, largest possible experiment you can squint at and say, ooh, that looks like not noise. I've done it. Um, because fidelity and accuracy matter. So there have been amazing strides in other ways to model these systems that people are interested in. And if your noise makes your accuracy worse than, say, an approximate mean field method, then what are you really doing with the device? We need to get close to things where we can actually say they're hard to simulate. And if we want to do that, then size is not the only factor. Accuracy or fidelity matter a lot. Um, and my prediction, which is my opinion, um, is doing an interesting simulation beyond 20 qubits will be extremely difficult without some form of error reduction techniques, even with amazing fidelities. And this is not a hard calculation to kind of convince yourself of. Um, the easiest way to do it is to attempt to run anything on any quantum device, and then you're done. Um, the other way <laughs> is... <laughs> is to do a back of the envelope calculation and say, imagine that I have really good gates. And I'm, by that, I'm going to mean I have you know, one out of every 1,000 two qubit gates has an error. And I'm going to put down some moderate depth circuit on 20 qubits. So if I have 20 qubits, I need to do enough gates to actually meaningfully entangle them. And I'll come to a back of the envelope fidelity of 80%. And you might say, that's actually a pretty good fidelity for that many gates on that system. But then you plug it into something like a hydrogen problem where you, you know the gap for the exact system, and you use a very generous bound for how much error this incurs in the energy of the ground state, which is if all of your errors put you exactly in the first excited state and no higher levels, you find that you have an error that's about two orders of magnitude larger than what you'd call chemical accuracy. And you feel very unsatisfied with this result. Um, so this is both a too pessimistic and too optimistic um, uh, calculation for various reasons. So you might imagine that fortuitous cancellation error of errors helps you, which they often do in chemistry simulations. But you fundamentally feel like you're at a pretty bad starting point if your name of the game is achieving more accuracy than a classical calculation. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about today is quantum error correction theory. Uh, can it help you on near-term devices and some additional challenges? So this is a thought that I think is not super common within the field, because if you look at what it means to achieve scalable fault tolerance, there's a lot of overhead in implementing all of these pieces that make you conclude that you need a ton of qubits, a ton of fidelity, and that you know, largely this is not transferable to a near-term device. So it creates this sort of step function in the field where people imagine that 
you know, we're going to do quantum supremacy at 50 qubits, maybe something vaguely more interesting at 100, and then the field is just stops until 10,000 or 100,000 qubits and error correction kicks in. And so my view is that that has to not be true. It can't be, and I feel that it would be so devastating if it was. So I'm going to show you a few results on a cheater way of importing some of the results from quantum error correction to make them applicable on devices today. So one of the core algorithms that we use on near-term devices are these quantum classical variational algorithms. So this, allow this is just built from me reformulating that eigenvalue problem that I told you tells me all the properties of my system for the ground state as a minimization from some expectation of a Hamiltonian, which is easy to sample from for most physical systems on my quantum device, based on a parameterized quantum state, which will just be that quantum neural networky looking thing that I put down. Um, and so basically this works by create some state by, say, setting your device to have certain angles of rotation or to have the beam splitter at some rotation, evaluate that objective, and then use a classical optimizer to try to change these parameters to minimize that energy to prepare the best state that my quantum device knows how to do. And this has the advantage that it can sort of adapt to the quantum device at hand. Um, there isn't some risk that it's going to be too long of a circuit for it to run. I'm simply trying to do the best with the device that I can. And this kind of general concept you'll find is now pervasive within quantum algorithms. Um, it appeared in chemistry first, and then has been transferred sort of to optimization, machine learning, nuclear physics, algorithm learning. But the idea is essentially the same, which is we have this theory that quantum devices produce hard to sample from distributions. Now what can we use those hard to sample distributions for? And how can we make sure it fits on any device that we care about? And of course, within this whole process, you're going to have these types of errors in your system that if you don't take care of them, you're probably not going to get enough accuracy. So how can we take care of that on devices that are coming up in the near future? Let's see. And so I think one of the easiest ways to understand this is actually to walk through one of these experiments and just highlight uh, how it's set up. They're quite uh, simple from the point of view of standing, up, standing one up and from algorithms. So what this is, is an experiment we did with the Martinez group. This was before I was at Google, so I phrase it that way. Um, the, uh, it has two uh, superconducting qubits that are pictured here at the top. And this is this quantum circuit down here that I mentioned you can just read as music notation from left to right. And what happens is that as you go from left to right, you have this lookup table I mentioned where this gate operation is done, which corresponds to some interaction here or pulse sequence. And you do this translation again and again. And you have one, one angle here that is left up to parameterization. So how much I rotate by Z on. And essentially what happens is I prepare this state. I do these measurements here at the end. And I collect each one of these individually and then classically just sum them together. So I have to do many repetitions to get good measurement statistics, but then this allows me to do a lot of the work offline classically. So essentially I've boiled the problem down into parts my quantum computer is good at, so creating hard probability distributions, and parts my classical computer is good at, which is add a lot of numbers together. So the general idea is you should not waste precious quantum resources on things that your classical computer is already extremely good at. And by doing this feedback loop, we iterate closer and closer to the ground state as we suggest new parameters. And eventually, we conclude that you know, an algorithm, the optimizer can't get any further. And we say, this was the best our device could do. So one nice thing that this achieves, besides being adaptable to run on essentially any experimental implementation that you have, is that it displayed a natural form of error suppression, which we were already happy about. What do I mean by that? So what is this plot that I'm showing you? So if you take the bond length, so this was a hydrogen simulation that we did, so H2, and we're just pulling it apart uh, across its bond, and I'm asking what the energy is at every point, and in this plot, I'm only showing you the error with respect to the right answer as a function of that bond distance. So this problem is small enough that you could solve it with, say, pencil, paper, and some motivation. Um, and so you can get the exact theoretical angle, which is the green green dots, and simply run that as is on the device. And so you do your best to calibrate up your device. You get the exact answer by pencil and paper. You run it, and these are the green dots that you get. And then the red dots are when we run this full feedback algorithm, what do you get? Um, and essentially, you know, the error is still not perfect, even though we have a good agreement between the relative dissociation. Um, but it drops the errors often by an order of magnitude. 
And so essentially what's happening is the device is kind of calibrating on the fly for more complex operations. This is not a perfect way to operate. Of course, one should always achieve better and better calibrations. And we tried our best in this experiment, the royal we in this sense. Um, but we still managed to achieve this uh, dramatic reduction in error, which makes us hopeful on near-term devices that these types of algorithms can be quite valuable. And one thing that we started to study in these near-term algorithms that I thought it would point out for interest is that this similarity between classical neural networks and quantum neural networks goes a little deeper than you might think. Um, so if you're familiar with the training of quantum neural networks or classical neural networks, you might know about this problem of vanishing gradients. And I mentioned to you this issue of readout complexity at least a little bit, which is fundamentally people think about reading out a number in, say, like a gradient descent algorithm classically, and you always take for granted that you read out one digit at a time. So the computer science way of phrasing this is that readout scales is log 1 over epsilon, whereas on the quantum side, we almost always have that we're randomly sampling from an output. It has more like Monte Carlo statistics. So if you have a very small gradient, um, it can take you a very long time to train one of these networks, and this problem is exacerbated by the quantum readout issue. And so we spent some time looking into this problem, and we actually noticed that um, there's a lot of similarities to information scrambling within black holes, which is interesting. Um, I'd invite you to just read the reference. I'm not going to go into to too great of detail um, at this time. But essentially, the problem is um, it's often that you initialize a, a circuit randomly because you might not know where the right uh, distribution is to direct that circuit, say if you're classifying numbers in, a, in an MNIST problem or something like that. And on the quantum side, something weird happens, which is if any subcomponent of your circuit is random enough, um, it will tend to scramble information in an interesting way. So it's perhaps not surprising that if you have a random thing at the end, any nice training you do gets scrambled. What's a little bit less intuitive is that if you have a random thing at the beginning, unscrambling it takes uh, exponential uh, cost, basically. So you have to be very careful in initialization. And this is just one of the things that we've highlighted for if you start to work on these types of networks, it becomes very important to think about all the weird catches that might come up because you're dealing with a high dimensional quantum system. So how do you go beyond this uh, ground state picture that I talked about um, without more qubits or gates? So what I talked about before was a general way of, say, preparing probability distributions where I have some function where I can evaluate how far away from it I am. And for chemistry, that meant preparing the ground states of atoms and molecules. But if you're interested in material science, you probably care about how things get excited or absorb light or do dynamical processes. Um, but we, you know, we can't really afford to do true dynamic simulation yet. And so how do you go beyond that without more uh, qubits or gates? So if you imagine that you did that original experiment perfectly, which is not a requirement, but um, we'll imagine for now that that's what we've done. So we've prepared this initial ground state. I would like to, a way to do only additional quantum measurements on this system and once again offload the hard part of the problem to some kind of classical offline problem. So I'm going to do some initial measure, additional measurements on a state I've already prepared. I'm going to solve this generalized eigenvalue problem and hopefully get at excited states. And this was the original hope of the, the method when it was designed. And it turned out to do a lot more than we thought it would. So one of the things I won't talk about is it actually allowed us to go outside of the original basis set. And it did get us excited states. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to kind of focus in on one aspect that is more interesting for the near-term applications, um, which is its ability to correct incoherent errors, which is a bit surprising. So how does this method actually work? I want to give you at least like an intuitive or a pictorial mathematical picture of what's going on. And the idea of how it's going to work is I have this complicated Hamiltonian, which tells me how my system moves around. And I'd like to learn how it behaves in a small subspace around my quantum state. So you can imagine that after I've gone through this variational process, I've created some quantum state here, which is parameterized by all those parameters that I cha uh, trained. And now I sort of only have that state, the ability to prepare it. I don't really have any other description of it. And I'm going to probe near that state. And I'm going to use some set of probe operators O that will typically, for convenience, be maybe poly operators, so simple things to implement on my quantum computer. Um, and I'm going to act this act on the state with the Hamiltonian uh, on there. And I'm going to probe with the same set of states. So if you're more of an applied math bent, this is often called a Galerican approximation. And it's a way of creating a closed representation of a subspace for some operator that I can then use to learn about that operator. 
Um, but the consequence of this is that if I write it down in the right way, you'll see that I can sort of use these extra operators and fold them into the Hamiltonian, which just changes the measurements that I'm going to do on my system and actually doesn't add any initial additional gates other than usually a layer of basis rotations, which on single qubit gates is usually not so expensive. And so by doing these extra measurements, I set up an offline matrix representation of this Hamiltonian um, that shows me how it acts in this reduced subspace and gives me a generalized eigenvalue problem. And when I solve this problem for its eigenvectors, C and energies E, I get better approximations to the ground state and I get excited states. Um, and I get a little bit of a surprise, which is that uh, it actually reduces incoherent errors as well, which is a bit shocking that you could do that in post-processing. So it's going to take me a minute to explain exactly how this happens, but I was lucky enough to be working at um, Berkeley Lab at the time and collaborating with Irfan Siddiqui's group. And we were able to do an experiment that verified this. Actually, we saw it earlier in computational predictions, but none of the referees believed us, and we're not sure if we believed ourselves either. So we then were able to do an experiment. And basically what happened was this is the same type of plot, internuclear distance and error. So you can see with time, error has gone down, which is nice. Um, but the I is the original kind of VQE algorithm, so using no expansion operators. And then I just decorate these uh, Hamiltonians by doing, say, sigma x rotations or a few different rotations on them. And with each additional operation, other than kind of statistical fluctuations, I sometimes reduce my errors by one or two orders of magnitude. And because we've already done this coherent tune-up process, we sort of believe that must, much of the error that we're reducing here is actually incoherent. So it becomes a question of how could it be the case that random post-processing measurements followed by a generalized eigenvalue problem can actually remove random errors in my system. And I'm going to kind of tell you a story that took a while to come around to and now borrows from uh, quantum error correction. So I'm going to give a very coarse grain look at what error correction is. I find that the field is a bit bimodal in its expertise. You are either an absolute quantum error correction expert and know everything, or you've kind of heard about it and you're kind of afraid of it. So I was in the, the latter category for a while, and I learned just enough to, to get by. Um, so what is error correction at a glance? So in the classical case, um, it's essentially the idea is I'm going to use redundancy to redundancy and some reasonable model of errors to protect my information. So if I just have classical bits, I can redundantly encode a 0 three times, redundantly encode a 1 in three classical 1 bits. And if I have a single bit flip, I can majority vote to correct that. So what I've done is redundantly encoded information and assumed that there was a reasonable error model that, for the most part, only one bit was going to flip at a time and not infold flips all the time. And in the quantum case, you can kind of push this right over to qubits. Um, and if you're only interested in bit flip errors, for example, you can just redundantly encode a 0 as three zeros, a 1 is three qubits and a 1. And you can do similar things. So it's actually a piece of note that it was hard to come up with quantum error correction. In fact, I believe people thought it was impossible until it was done. And this was for various reasons, which were related to, say, the no cloning theorem, and also that measurement tends to destroy information. So if you did something like here, like just broadcast a zero to many zeros, that would be forbidden by fundamental quantum mechanics. And if you did something like uh, checking each individual bit, you might destroy the information as well. But they came up with clever methods by encoding the redundancies through engineered symmetries. And this is kind of the trick that allowed a lot of these codes to start being uh, analyzable and workable. And I won't go into too deep of a uh, statement other than to say it allows you to measure aggregate quantities to tell where the errors are and correct them without revealing so much information that you destroy the state. And about, I'm going to kind of sketch all that you'll need to know about this general type of uh, error correcting procedure for the rest of this talk, which is typically you choose some set of these symmetries to define how you're going to encode the information. And you get a, a nice cartoon that I've drawn over here, which is if I have some code or good words that are defined by these types of symmetries, then my goal is to move between these blue subspaces evenly um, and to avoid spending too much time in the red spaces. So if I have some type of error over here that's checked by one of these uh, syndrome measurements, I try to push it back to the original state as quickly as possible to avoid uh, bleeding over too many times and having a logical error. So this is kind of the name of the game. For example, in the repetition code that I showed you, this was the stabilizers. 
and you have some set of logical operators that kind of generalize the idea of a bit flip. And in general, coming up with ways to operate on these codes can be quite challenging, but I'm going to focus on just protection of information for now. So as I mentioned, error correction is this powerful tool that kind of convinced a lot of people that quantum computing might be a viable uh, area to, to pursue. And it has these amazing properties that it's scalable to exponential error suppression. Um, the unfortunate fact is if I take a device that I have in the lab today, implementing those scalable proposals often have constraints that are far beyond what my device can do. For example, it's very hard to do fast uh, measurement and feedback. Um, it's very hard to kind of arrange the qubits with a connectivity that might match what that code demands. And so you're, you're left to conclude that there might be this kind of plateau before you're able to, say, use this technology and algorithms. And what we wanted to do was say, well, this isn't going to be a perfect solution, but can we at least show where this technology will be applicable in uh, sort of near-term applications? So what we did was just say, how can I sort of use the same technology? And instead of doing this correction loop, I'm just going to figure out a very near-term compatible way of removing the erroneous subspaces. And I'm going to assume that if my computation is short enough, I don't get far enough outside this blue space that the blue space still gives me a good signal. Um, and I'm going to tell you how I do that in a second, but the, the, the upside is that we've seen this considerably reduces errors for small experiments. Doesn't require any explicit syndrome measurement or feed forward, which is actually why it obtains very high thresholds, or pseudo thresholds rather. It allows you to test codes in current hardware without any actual kind of connectivity constraints. And it's like error detection, but without explicit stabilizers, which often carried their own overhead. Um, the downsides is it carries a number of measurement repetitions that cost you with the fidelity of the state. So if your state is quite bad, you're going to pay in many more repetitions. If your state is quite good, you actually add no additional cost. And I'll show you how that is in a second. So basically, the fundamental thing that I'm going to use to construct these in practice is going to be um, these code space projectors, which are, of course, well known to people which is I take these engineered symmetries that I have, I expand them out in a large product, which will be uh, many, many uh, terms. And I'm going to say my problem is I want the expectation of some observable A expressed in my logical space to a higher accuracy. And I'm just going to chug through the motions and write this down explicitly as a sampling over these different states. And what I find first is that there's only additional poly averages that I need to do. Um, meaning that I'm going to reprepare my state many times and do one final poly rotation at the end, but sample from a lot of them. And then the second thing you say is, well, I, uh, I caught you. You have an exponential number in the number of stabilizers of things that happen here. But there's another trick, actually, which is if you sample from this stochastically, what happens is that every element came from the stabilizer group. And so if you had no errors, this just becomes the identity. And your sampling statistics from stochastic sampling are the same as your original problem. So if you could create a perfect state, your uh, sampling would be the same as the original problem. And as your state's damaged, you have to pay additional to average out the errors. So you're, kind of, you're not actually doing post-detection or correction. What you're doing is an averaging out of the errors by washing them out. Then you pay more and more as your state gets worse, but you often do better in the state itself. So I told you this story about measuring states around a particular starting point. And you might say, OK, that scheme sounds very nice, but how is it connected to that experiment you did where the actual errors were reduced uh, for your experiment? And so you might think that there's one of these situations might be true. Uh, the desired symmetry subspace is not known. For example, you didn't engineer symmetries into the problem. Um, one may want to use projectors not based on symmetry. You might want to be able to make a trade-off where I remove part of my state, but it works for this system and not another, and a problem Hamiltonian that exists that prefers some logical states over others. So you might have more knowledge than just the code space. And we can sort of generalize what we just wrote down and say that if I have a projector that's a sum of many terms, and I allow these coefficients c to be arbitrary, how do I rephrase this problem in terms of uh, an optimization, basically? And what I'll say is that if I have some code space Hamiltonian, which is something like my encoding and penalizing violations from that code space, and a problem Hamiltonian, which might be, say, like a chemistry problem, um, then I would like to minimize the energy of that joint Hamiltonian subject to the constraint that I have a real state, basically. <clears throat> 
And if you write down this parameterization and you plug everything through, this actually has an immediate solution in terms of a generalized eigenvalue problem, which is exactly the problem that we wrote down before in the other paper and took us a long uh, two years to engineer our way back to. Um, so we made a good guess, I guess I would say. And so the result of this problem is that when you solve it, you get out coefficient c that defined an optimal projector for finding you both a minimal distance to the code space and minimizing the energy. So this actually allows you to correct logical errors in some way, which is that if the problem Hamiltonian biases you towards one logical state, it can actually help funnel everything into that state, which would not be true in typical error correction where there's not a bias between logical states. So we were very happy about that. So that's all the machinery. Does it actually work for small systems? And while I won't be able to show you experimental data yet, I can show you some uh, kind of toy examples. So we just looked initially at the perfect 513 code. So to break down this notation for you, I use five physical qubits to redundantly encode one logical qubit that has a distance of three. So that means if I do a, up to a weight three poly error, that would cause a logical uh, error, basically. This is the, the stabilizer generators for that system, and this is the simplest representation, though not the most compact, of the logical ones. And we did a simple numerical experiment, which is we just prepared a state in the code space. We applied a deep, an independent depolarizing channel on each of the five qubits. And then we checked the logical infidelity after this happened. And to, to tell you what the different lines are, this is the number of these uh, projectors that I included. So the stochastic scheme doesn't care so much, but the projective scheme includes all of these. And so L equals 4 is including all of the projectors. And we're comparing to this dotted line here and this dashed line here. So the dashed line is if I did this encoding and I didn't do any recovery. I just said I'm going to use five extra qubits for no good reason. And this one, of course, does terribly. So infidelity, higher is worse. Um, and this is if I used a single qubit and applied the same noise channel to the single qubit, what happens? So one, there are a few different definitions of this, but one coarse definition of the pseudo threshold is if I do this process in an encoded system and use my recovery procedure, when do I do better than the unencoded system? And because we don't do any explicit syndrome measurements, we don't have any ancilla qubits, we don't have any of that overhead, the pseudo threshold actually turns out to be quite high. It's almost exactly 50% in this case, which is about the information theoretic limit I believe that you can reach. Um, and there's a case where we do a transversal X operation and apply the same thing where I just called it in this case the gate error, but the same thing is happening in independent depolarizing channels being attached. And for the, the fully projected system, the errors, the pseudo threshold is now something like 0.49 if I remember right. And so you get a fairly minimal overhead in the, the requirements on your gates for seeing some advantage in encoding. And this makes us really happy, not because we think this alone is going to change the world, but because it evidences to us that there might be something in this field of kind of importing quantum error correction onto our devices and extending the logical space-time volume before there's this kind of phase transitions into magic state distillation factories and things like that. And so one additional case we're quite interested in because we, we study physical systems quite often is if you're studying interacting electron systems or physical systems, you might know some other symmetries than the ones you engineered. So say, I don't have enough qubits to redundantly encode. I only have some kind of physical system I'm interested in. Can I still use this for something interesting? And there's a few challenges with this. So for example, in fermion systems, we know about number conservation, spin conservation, and all kinds of other things. Um, it might be hard to remove for a single symmetry, but we can kind of bake down easier symmetries like number parity or spin parity or something like this. And it gives us a natural set of symmetries to use that we don't even have to use this redundant encoding. And so you might say, well, doesn't then that allow you to just remove qubits from your system? And wouldn't that be the superior approach? It turns out that's not always the case. Sometimes when you remove those qubits, you pay in an overhead that makes the encoding so much worse, you need more gates, and overall you don't win. And this has an analogy in kind of um, subsystem error correcting codes. But um, nonetheless, we wanted to see how this worked. So in this case, we used a hydrogen molecule that was not encoded at all, at two different geometries, the same logical infidelity and depolarizing probability for each qubit. And in this case, there's no encoding. So it's essentially always better to use these symmetries, as it often is in physics, to use symmetries when they're blatantly available. And we used two things, which were um, 
these first two are actual symmetries of the system. The last one is not a symmetry of the system. We wanted to test how our method actually applied non-symmetries, where it is making a trade-off, where it says, I do a projection that's not exact, but maybe that's still better than having my noisy part of my state. And so for this case, those two overlap. There is always a massive reduction in error, um, relatively speaking, in the fidelity. And in this case, you're actually able to use the non-symmetry to some advantage, basically. So you don't need to digest this table. I just want to make a quick point as I'm closing out that a lot of these developments and algorithms, as I mentioned, have been a very close collaboration between people who are experts in, say, a domain area, like chemistry or physics, and people who are quantum algorithms experts. In a very short number of years, we've gone from scalings that are like n to the 11 down to something like n to the third for exact chemistry simulation, meaning I do exact simulation or full CI for the same cost as someone else does DFT, basically. And we've gone all the way down to constant factors and error correction and seen that it's on the order of hundreds of seconds. So it's not totally unreasonable. Um, but these. These required a lot of very close collaborations between a lot of disparate experts. And so it looks like it's very hard to get into this field. And if you say, what's a typical chemistry problem workflow? You have to specify a molecule that includes its XYZ, spin, discretization. The integral generation, which defines the problem itself, requires knowledge of basis sets, these esoteric software packages. And eventually, you map to qubits, you choose an algorithm, and you have some kind of mapping to hardware. And so you have some people in the room that, for example, that are algorithms experts that are saying, oh, these last few parts, that's very easy. I'll tack onto that. A quantum chemist would say, oh, this is my bread and butter. I could do it in my sleep. But linking from top to bottom can often be quite challenging. Huh. I guess that's my aggressive cutoff, but I'll keep pushing through. <laughs> On a few slides left, I promise. So that workflow, we basically wanted to replace with open source software that allows you to take each of those complicated steps and do one at a time, essentially. And so if you're an expert in any one part of this, you can kind of slide in, replace only that part, and the rest is mostly taken care of for you. And we feel like a lot of these application-specific packages are going to be crucial for making uh, progress in the field. And ours is called Open Fermion, that we strongly believe in open source contributions that you can find in the same repository as CERC or at openfermion.org. Um, and I won't get into too much of the detail, but we've tried to keep a strong ethos of kind of Apache 2 open source welcoming collaborations. Any student who jumps on board, we try to help them working on it, and they can join the co-authorship on the, the release paper. Um, and we're very excited about that kind of endeavor. And just to kind of briefly summarize, so you'll have at least two minutes to ask me questions. Um, basically, the message that I wanted to get home is it's a very exciting time to be in quantum computing. You're about to see some, I think, very exciting developments in the next few years. But using those towards practical applications is still going to be challenging. We have a lot of work to do. And I think that working in this er uh, intersection between error correction and near-term devices is a fruitful one. And developing applications requires a lot of collaborations between experts in domains and quantum computing. Um, and with that, I'd like to just thank all of the people who collaborated with me closely on some of these results and all of you for uh, coming to listen to me speak. Thanks a lot.